Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, another day for our Aquarium Online Academy. Today, we are all going to be focusing on something a little bit more specific about the different habitats that our animals live he here at the aquarium. So I know a lot of the times we talk about the animals or special adaptations and everything. We'll definitely get a chance to talk about that. But I also want us to think about well, what do you think their exhibit and their here at the aquarium? What do you think has to go into that? What do we need to think about when we're thinking about building a habitat for these animals? So if you have any thoughts today, any questions, any observations, anything you want to share, I definitely invite you to do so. Uh, we do have a live text line that you can use. And that live text line you can see on the screen right on over here. That number is 562-286-1838. So if you are watching this live, you can send in any of those thoughts, questions, observations, this live text line over here. But if you are watching this after it's been weird live, so about after 1030 this morning, you can still send in your questions and observations and thoughts. But instead of using this live text line, you're going to want to use this email. So that email is live at lbaop.org. But once again, if you are watching live, you're going to want to use this live text line right here, which once again, I definitely invite you to engage with so like that we can talk about um, your thoughts and your questions and I can gear towards those topics over there. I'm also definitely not alone in the studio today either. I do have Jen on the computer right in front of me and she's going to be taking us on our adventure today, showing us all the very cool things that go into these habitats and exhibits. She's giving you a very nice wave. And then I have Ali on the other computer. Um, um, who is going to be receiving your questions or anything like that. Um, you can check on Ali, see how she's doing as well. But like I said, today we are going to be talking about well, what goes into a habitat. So first, what I want to do is I just want to look at any habitat that Jen wants to put up um, for us. And then we can go ahead and just make some observations. And I know I keep saying that word as well, habitat. Have you heard that word before? What is a habitat? Hmm. I'll let you think about that for a second and we'll take a look at this exhibit and then we'll go ahead and explore that word a little bit more and we'll explore some different habitats that you can see out in the ocean here at the aquarium. So let's see. <laughs> let me step right off of camera. You can see one of our giant sea bass knows that we arrived. It was just looking at the camera. Um, but this is our um, a kelp forest habitat that we have here at the aquarium that's called our blue cavern exhibit. So what do you see in here? You can focus on living things and also non-living things. But like I was asking before, well, what is a habitat? What does that word mean? So you might be familiar with that word already. It's a place where animals and plants live. So it's their home. So this giant sea bass right in front of the camera, this is its home. It's going to be living in the kelp forest out there in the ocean. But like I mentioned, this is an exhibit here at the aquarium that we're taking a nice close look at. Um, so you can see the different things that make up this habitat. Maybe you've already noticed, obviously, the different animals, right? It's kind of hard to miss the animals right now. So you can see the different types of fish. We had an eel that was on the camera for a second. You might see our shark swimming around. And then we also have all of this algae right here, all of this kelp. But what about the non-living things? Did you notice anything about the non-living things? So we have different types of rocks in here, all this different rock work in here. So we can see lots of different things, right, that compose this habitat here. But there's Ooh, so someone sent in that a habitat is a community for animals. So definitely. So and we're going to see so many different communities. So this is one of these cold water communities. And I love that we use that word because it really is a community. Um, so we have these cold water communities with these kelp forests that bring all these animals together to live here. And there's also warm water communities. So I'll give Jen a second to pull, it up, pull up a coral reef. And then we can look at a coral reef just to compare these different two habitats. So now that we're making some observations on these habitats, observing different animals and different things I also want us to be thinking about well what do you think goes into that out in the ocean there's definitely so many different factors at play um so many different things that can happen day to day right so you can think about that but also think about well here at the aquarium 
how can we make it be like the ocean and how can we make conditions be very similar to that but let me step off of the camera here because now here we have a warm water habitat so i'll give you a second um to take a look at this warm water habitat this coral reef and i see that i just got a question and if eels and giant sea bass have predators and that's a really great question um i know eels would have a number of predators, I would believe, um, and maybe not too many. Ooh, okay, so I am uh, working with the studio right now to make sure I give you the right predators. Um, so it seems that octopus um, are a predator for eels. Um, so they'll be snacking on eels out there in the ocean. Um, eels also do a very good job, though, I do want to say, of hiding in between all those crevices and the rocks um, that we are looking at in the kelp forest. Um, so they do a really great job at hiding and the spiny lobster actually will live together with eels in those holes um, to be able to protect them. And here we have, uh, we're now referring to the giant sea bass, is when we were looking at those giant sea bass and it was right in front of the camera, you probably noticed it was really, really big. Um, the giant sea bass can weigh anywhere from around 400 to 500 pounds, uh, measuring around five to six feet. So when they're that size, it would really be hard for um, other animals to be able to eat them. But when they're babies, they are a lot smaller than what we were looking at. So if you look at your thumb, right? So take a nice good look at your thumb and look at your thumbnail. When they're babies, they're that small or even smaller. So when they're that small, I am more than positive that a bigger fish would come by and eat some of them. But when they're huge, like we were talking about, not too many animals are going to want to go near the giant sea bass um, just because they're so big. And they're probably afraid of the giant sea bass eating them. The giant sea bass are like giant vacuums. So they'll open up their mouths and then and the food will go inside. That's my giant sea bass impersonation. <laughs> but here, like I mentioned, we are at a coral reef habitat. So hopefully we've gotten a good second to take a good look at this coral reef habitat. What have you noticed of this coral reef habitat? One very obvious thing, um, especially because I keep saying coral reef habitat, is we're looking at coral, right? Coral is one of these factors that's going to be making up this habitat that we are looking at. So you can see this hab um, this coral all over um, this exhibit. So this is another live camera we have here at the aquarium for our coral predators. So um, our parrotfish that we have here at the aquarium. So you may have noticed that. You may have noticed all the different types of fish, right? What are some differences you notice between this habitat and the last habitat we were looking at too? Because that's another thing that we have to um, pay attention to, right? Depending on the animal, where they live in the ocean, if it's warm or cold water, sometimes you'll find different surroundings. You'll find different things inside of it, like coral versus kelp. You'll even see different colors out there in the ocean. So we also have to make sure our exhibits are the right colors for our animals. You can also pay attention to what animals live with each other because that's something our aquarists definitely have to pay attention to is, is it okay for these animals to live together? And I do see I have some questions coming in. So I do want to answer one right now is if the coral is alive. So that's a really great question. So here, like I mentioned, the camera that we're looking at is our coral predators camera. Um, so some of our friends in here, especially the parrotfish, right on cue right there actually, love to eat coral. Out in the ocean, they'll hang out around reefs. So I'm pretending to be a parrotfish swimming around. And when they find a piece of coral that's fallen off of the reef, they'll munch on it. So they have a very good and modified beak. So the word parrot um, kind of gives us a hint that they are going to have a very strong beak-like mouth to be able to munch on that coral out in the ocean. So with that being said, the coral that we do have inside of our exhibit isn't real. It's actually artificial. It's made out of different cements. It's made out of different plastics. If it was real, it would be gone in less than a week. So we do use artificial coral, um, which is another thing that we had to think about, right? When we were making this home for the parrotfish is, should we use real coral? It, would really, really, it really wouldn't last. So using artificial coral um, would definitely be helpful um, to our exhibits. So the majority of the corals you actually um, maybe have seen at the aquarium if you've ever come here or if you've tuned into our other programs and gotten a look at different exhibits 
is not real they'll still use it in the same ways they're using it out there in the ocean though which is really what is important to us so that's a really great question because it does bring that point of us having to think about what goes into the exhibit the same thing with the kelp we were looking at in our um, kelp forest before that's all artificial as well so it's not real there are some animals that like to eat kelp but also friends things like corals um, and things like that kelp are really hard to take care of you have to think about things like water temperature how clean the water is you have to clean it a lot more often um, some animals like coral are really really sensitive as well so there's lots of different factors um, to all these different things so i really do love that we're thinking about this so this coral in here once again is artificial um, but we do have some live coral exhibits here at the aquarium i believe we have two or three of them and that is a real living animal which if you've never heard about that fact, I do just want to say coral is an animal. I know it kind of looks like a rock, it kind of looks like a plant, but it's a living animal that will grow. And is another thing they also have to be aware of when putting it into the exhibit, who they're putting it in with. Um, and I see I've gotten some more questions um, on this board. Ooh, but here Jen just put up um, a, a video or a picture. Um, of a live coral exhibit that we have here so you can see how it looks a little bit different but the same way the fishes are using the live coral in this exhibit they're using it also in those artificial coral exhibits Ooh, so i see a few more questions is do we make waves and kelp forest exhibits which is a really really great question because we actually do have an exhibit here um, that will have those waves and everything so i'll give jen a second to see if she can tr maybe try and find that for us but yes definitely depending on where the animals live they'll be feeling more waves out there in the ocean um so some waves like in the exhibit um, that we are pulling up right now are very very obvious so those waves will come on and you can see those waves out there in the ocean i'm making my own wave with my hand right now and then throughout the day it'll be on and off because in the ocean sometimes the water gets really calm and then all of a sudden it'll be rough and then all of a sudden it'll be calm again um, other ones, you really have to focus on other things because it's just an ongoing current system. So it won't have those waves crashing above the surface, but you'll definitely be able to take notes of the currents inside of these different habitats. So you can see the sway that this kelp is swaying back and forth. Even the animals and the fish, they're not swimming back and forth. It's just the way that the current is going on in the exhibit. So we won't always have very obvious waves, but we will have different currents going on in the exhibits for the animals, especially depending on where they live. So here, this is our amber forest exhibit. So in this part of the kelp forest, we're going to be looking more towards the top, more towards the surface. So out there in the ocean, you'll definitely feel a little bit more movement back and forth. Versus that blue cavern exhibit that we were looking at um, initially, that's more towards the bottom and more towards the top of the ocean so the current system in there won't be too strong and you won't it won't be as obvious as this one but it is still going on in there so that's another really great question and i see that someone is asking how do we get the salt water here at the aquarium so we actually get our salt water by the truckload um, so we work with Catalina Water Company and they'll bring our water here at the aquarium and then that's how we're able to take it into our exhibits. So some exhibits will get full water changes um, and they'll have clean water all the time. Um, well, fresh salt water that is clean. All the water is clean here at the aquarium is what I'm trying to say. But some of them will get that full um, water change while other exhibits like our tropical exhibit. That's a very big exhibit um, that we have here at the aquarium. We'll get an informal water change. So that's water coming in as some water comes out because we can't completely empty out that exhibit. Um, that exhibit is around 350,000 gallons of water. Um, so that's a lot of water. Um, so that one, once again, we'll have water coming in as water comes out for us to be able to clean it a little bit more formally. And then I see that someone else is asking if we have fresh water exhibits. Um, so I believe our only fresh water exhibit may be where we have our steelhead trout. Um, Oh, and our amphibian friends, our frogs, um, those are going to be fresh water as well. But we won't have too many fresh water exhibits here at the aquarium. The majority of them, about 90, 95 percent, um, will be that salt water um, with those two exceptions that we have here. And then 
I see that we have a question that is asking, how do we keep track of how much the smaller schooling fish eat? Um, so that's a really great question, right? Because you must have taken note of all the different sizes of all the different animals that we have here. Um, so we have really small fish. Um, in our blue cavern, we have sardines. And then we also have really big fish, like giant sea bass. Um, so with those smaller fish, it's really just based on observations um, that we're able to keep track of how much they eat. We wouldn't be able to feed every sardine one single piece of fish. There's over a thousand of them. Um, so they do what you call a scatter feed. So they throw food at the top of the exhibit and then the sardines are able to grab it. And then we're just able to monitor their behavior, how they look, how they're swimming, um, if they're energetic, lethargic, anything like that. And that's how we're able to keep track of them. And we're definitely thinking about those different things, um, everyone, that about what makes up these exhibits, right? We have to take note of all the different sizes of fish that are in there, all the different sizes of animals, what is getting put into the exhibit. We've also talked about temperatures, how some animals live in cold water, some animals live in warm water. Um, and then also if we're going to use living or non-living things or replicas of things like those corals, right? Um, and then I see another question which someone is thinking about is if we, if we watch our animals 24 7 so that is a thing we definitely have to keep in mind um, when we are making these exhibits is we have to be able to keep eyes on our animals right um, because animals will definitely have their own side quests sometimes and they like to play in different ways do different things some animals like to just hang out and chill sometimes other animals are like oh yeah it's nighttime it's time for me to wake up because they're nocturnal so they'll be more active during the nighttime um, so we do have life support here at the aquarium present 24 hours, seven days a week. So if anything is going on with any of ex the exhibits, um, if anything is going on with any of the animals, they are able to help them out. So that is another thing that goes into that. We also have all of these different things going on behind the scenes here between behind all these different habitats and exhibits we've explored. Um, so we have different filtration systems which are able to clean the water like we've spoken about, keep an eye on the temperature, water flow, make sure that no one is overflowing anything like that. Um, and th all these things are very, very important um, in order to provide the best home possible for all these different animals that live here at the aquarium, which you can find all around the world so it just gives you an idea of all the different things um, that we are able to monitor um, every single day here at the aquarium and our um, life support team will walk by make sure everything looks right and fine and then during the day our aquarist and animal staff who work with these different animals will also be keeping an eye on this cleaning the exhibits that they're taking care of and all with that being said though friends um i do know Oh, okay. Um, so very shortly, though, we will be having a special guest. So just keep your eyes peeled for that. But in the meantime, our, our guest arrives. I do want to answer a couple more of these, these questions because you are all sending in really, really great questions. Is Oh, okay. So now we're thinking back to that parrotfish exhibit. So friends, hopefully we're all comparing these different exhibits and these thought processes with these different animals because we're definitely getting a good look at all these different habitats out there. Um, so I see that someone is asking, how do the animals not eat the coral? So once again, with that coral predator camera that we are looking at, um, which is where you can find those parrotfish, and the coral in here is not real. So we don't have to worry about them really going on over um, and trying to munch on the coral or anything like that. I am more than sure, probably less than 10 minutes with the, of the parrotfish being in this exhibit for the very first time they knew this coral wasn't real. But like I mentioned, it's just important to us that they use it in the same way that they're using it out there in the ocean. So these animals will use it as their home um, to hide away from predators or maybe some of the smaller fish to be able to camouflage, to have any babies if they're laying eggs or anything like that. That's what matters to us here. So they'll do the same thing with the coral as well as the kelp um, and like in that blue cavern exhibit. However, with that being said, everyone, I do see that our special guest is being wheeled in. Um, so I will give them a second to get set up and Gary will be talking to us about his furry friend that he bought today and talking more about these habitats and exhibits. So we're just going to go ahead and get set up with that. 
And then after these questions and awe, um, we will get back to answering some of your questions that I see some of you have sent in because there are lots of different factors that go into all of this. So I'm going to go ahead and step off of the camera and I will let our special guests get into position over here. So I know we can't hear you, but you can give Gary a round of applause. We're so excited to have him here. Woo! Yeah. And he works with so many of our different animals here at the aquarium as well. He works with our birds, our penguins, snakes, reptiles, and with our friend who's going to be coming here. I'm really trying to not spoil it for you all, but Gary is an expert with these animals, which is why it's really great for him to be able to care for them. So here we have Gary. Okay, there we go. Is it working now? Oh, yep. Pick this off too. Okay, let's start all over again. Sorry about that. Get our, everything together here. So my name is Gary, and I have the opportunity to work with a lot of different animals on the aquarium, as of as you were told. And one of the fun things that I do, not only with interacting with them, is I want to make sure that when I'm not around and they're at home, they are still entertained and still find fun things to do. So. I mean, as we have to spend more and more time at home, you realize that if you see the same thing every day and you do the same thing every day, it can get kind of boring. So the idea is to come up with clever ways for the animal to entertain themselves when you're not around so that being home is fun. Now, every animal has certain things that they like to do. So if you ever had a cat, you know, they might like to chase light or they might like to play with a ball of string. A dog usually likes to play catch. There's some animals that won't do that kind of thing. <laughs> so if you give them a ball or a ball of string, they're just going to look at you funny and say, what are you doing? So I've got a classic example of that right now. Excuse me while I go off camera just a second, because I am going to bring out one of my fun little guys that I work with, who is an opossum. How's that camera work? There we go. I'm going to put that right there. I'm going to ask him to come out. And so you can watch him as he's eating. And I can tell you one of the things that we do to entertain them. So obviously they like a variety of different kinds of food. They'll find that entertaining. So I've got some carrots here. I have some strawberries. Those are always good. Those smell good. Got some grapes. They like dog chow, which keep that in mind. If you leave a dog food outside, you might be attracting things like opossums and skunks. Anyway, so I got the food out there for him, a wide variety in his little bowl that he's comfortable with. I'm going to ask him to come out. Now, keep in mind, that opossums naturally move a little slow. That's their main protection when they're dealing with their environment is to be slow and quiet. So he's going to come out here and he's going to use that very sensitive nose of his to see where I put the food in his little bowl. I think he's getting it. He's got the smell right now. There you go. Good job, Ozzy. There you go. What a good boy. All right. So with Ozzy, as I said, he's not going to play with a ball, not going to play with string. What he's going to do, we're going to go ahead and look at his natural behaviors and see if we can act on that and make things fun that they would naturally do if they were by themselves. So one of the things that we can do is we can hide food around his exhibit or his home, and he can find creative ways of foraging for food. So we might take something like just like a randomly like a bone, and we might just go ahead and put a little food in there. And we'll hide it somewhere in his home where he won't know where it is. And it, but he'll be able to smell it because that's what he uses, his sense of smell really well. He'll be able to smell it and he'll be able to go ahead and find it. And that'll be something to keep him entertained when we're not around. We also have other little toys that we can give him that, again, are not something that, that he bats around like a football, but just ways of clever ways to find food. And it's funny because the only ones I could see were green. So this is his, inv his invisible magic feeding dish. I think this might look fun if we put it out here and see what happens. I'm going to stick with something in here. 
We can just put a little food in here and leave him with that for a while and let him try to figure out how to open it. I'm going to give him something really stinky. I'm going to give him a little mouse. Mice are stinky. They like stinky. Let's see, can we find it in his invisible food tray? He's sniffing it. He knows it's there and he scores. Good job. So you see that's something to entertain him with. Another thing that we can do, knowing that they use their sense of smell more than their eyesight, we can give them certain things to smell at. So we might give them an object that looks perfectly normal that he would find in an everyday environment. We'll leave it in his enclosure. Make sure that he's comfortable with it. We don't want to overwhelm him with things that might make him a little uncomfortable. But when we know we like something, then we can start changing it just a little bit. So when he goes out there, oh my gosh, what happened? Now, today, it smells like steak seasoning salt. <laughs> I'm sure that's a hit. I'm sure he loves that. Nothing like a little juicy steak. What else can this board smell like? Onion breath. Nice. <laughs> Onion breath is always effective. This is the one I find questionable. And where I would like it, chili powder. I think that would make me sneeze. But he enjoys that. So again, you can find little pieces of cloth, little pieces of wood, anything that um, will be in his environment that you can make a different scent for that he will discover the night and be like, ooh, what is this? This is kind of fun. Lastly, you know, when we're working with him, we also want to give him things to climb on because that's what they would naturally do in their environment is to climb around. I'm going to give him a little more food. He's being so cute out here. We give him things to climb up. But if you look at Ozzy, and you're getting a really good picture of this right now, look at his tail, how it's kind of curled behind him, and his body's kind of a little bit hunched over. That's because he was rescued. He wasn't doing well when he was a baby, and so he came to the aquarium, and we took care of him. So he's very happy here, and he has lots of fun things to interact with, but he's never really quite grew up to be a normal-looking opossum. So for him to climb, he gets very clumsy. And he likes to climb, but then he feels bad if he falls out of his tree. So we want to make sure we give him things to climb on, but it's safe where he can feel confident and climb around his enclosure. And we can change those every night. So when he comes out of his little den box, when he wakes up, he has different things to climb on. But we want to make sure it's safe. Now lastly, we know that they like to kind of snuggle up and hide in bushes and leaves, small little holes in the ground. So when he's sleeping, we could just give him a box, but that's no fun. Oh, Ozzy just said, feed me more. Did you hear that? I know. There you go. There's a little bit more. There's some carrots, some strawberry. Here's a grape. You like grapes. Take that. So when he goes to sleep, instead of just giving him a little den box, that's not fun. We give him different blankets that have different textures. This is his favorite blanket. Of course, I think he just, I just washed it for him. It's his Luke Skywalker blanket. Not a lot of green in that. Good. And so then he'll snuggle up in that. If it's a warm day, we give him a soft little sh uh, sheet. A hot day, we give him Luke Skywalker. So, I mean, a cold day. All right, and then he can bunch it up. And it's so funny because he basically will take that object that we give him to sleep in, and he makes himself into a little opossum burrito. And we'll find him all snuggled up in his little blanket in the morning. So we'll give him different blankets. And every night, he can, as he gets ready to go to bed, he can fluff up the blanket however he wants to do it. Now we're going to go ahead and ask him to go home. I'm talking about how to keep him entertained and things like that, but keep him, I do want to bring out some questions as I'm asking him to go home. First of all, does everybody know that he's not a rat? Right? He's not a rodent. So he doesn't have teeth that he needs to chew on. So giving him something to chew on would not be something fun for an opossum because they don't need to chew. But they are marsupials, and it's the only marsupial found in North America, and that's kind of cool. Barsupial is just a big word that says that they have a pouch and that the babies when they're born are really tiny and they crawl into the pouch on their mom and the mom takes care of them in the pouch until they're old enough to crawl out on their own and they'll frequently go and climb on their mom's back and hang out there with their mom for a little while until they start falling off and then becoming uh, going into the real world on themselves. The way I communicate with um, Ozzy is by making small tapping sounds I'm going to have him see if he can find out his little crate is. He's smelling. That's what they do. You missed your crate, buddy. Great eyesight. Warned you about that. There you go. And you go ahead and sneak in there. We work on opossum time. He's got it. Slow and easy. That's how you stay alive. Slow and quiet. There you go. Good job, Ozzy. I hope you enjoyed meeting Ozzy and finding out how he gets fun opportunities to play with his environment. 
And uh, again, my name is Gary. Thank you very much. So much for Gary for bringing the cutest friend ever today, Ozzy. And we got to learn more about Ozzy and his habitat, right? We've spoken about how there's different things in all those different animals, habitats that we were looking at before, like the parrotfish, the giant sea bass and everything. Um, so now you can get an idea as to how the different animals here at the aquarium are as well. And you might also be asking, why is Ozzy here at the aquarium? He doesn't live underwater, so we do have different animals that will be living here at the aquarium as well, um, like some of our program ambassador animals. So they are representatives for their species, so like that we're able to talk about them and bring them up to you. But I would do want to say thank you so much for joining us today, friends. You had so many great questions, and we will still answer those questions. Um, just if you are not watching live, and if you do want to send in any questions about anything that we spoke about, anything we didn't get to about Ozzy, instead of using this live text line, you are going to want to use this email, uh, which is live at LBA op.org there is definitely a lot going on today which is a lot of fun um, but teachers, if we are watching today as well, I do please ask if we can send in our student numbers. So how many students you may have been tuning in with today? This just gives us a better idea as to how many people we have tuning in so like that we can better serve our community and continue to serve our community. But once again, friends, thank you so much for joining us and have a good rest of your day.